Pulmonary Mechanics in Non-Invasive Positive Pressure Ventilation by Dr. Brian McAlvin. Hello, my name is Brian McAlvin, and I'm an intensivist in the Division of Medicine Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital. Today I'll be speaking about non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Review of NIPPV. First, let's start with some terminology. NPPV or NIPPV refers to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. There are two varieties of NPPV that we'll be talking about, CPAP and BiPAP. CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. BiPAP stands for bilevel positive airway pressure. You'll see on the slide that there are three graphs. The top two represent patients on CPAP. The top one shows a continuous positive airway pressure of five and the respiratory cycle where pressures go below and above that value throughout the respiratory cycle. During inspiration, the patient generates a negative pressure and during expiration generates a positive pressure. In the second graph, that also represents CPAP, but some ventilators have a setting whereby the pressure can be reduced during exhalation for patient comfort represented by the red arrows on the graph. Ventilators at Boston Children's Hospital have that setting. Finally, the third graph shows a patient on BiPAP, where just like CPAP, there's a continuous positive airway pressure on the bottom, known as EPAP, or expiratory positive airway pressure, as well as an inspiratory positive airway pressure that's given to the patient when they draw a breath. It's an assisted breathing pattern. And you see that the pressure cycle between the end positive airway pressure and the peak inspiratory positive airway pressure. Three more curves to consider. Very similar to the ones that we looked at, but this instead is a measurement of alveolar pressure. If we were to measure the pressure in the alveolus, this is what you would see. The top left shows a normal patient without any positive pressure ventilation, where the pressure cycle below and above a value of zero throughout the respiratory cycle. The top right figure shows a patient on CPAP, and the bottom figure shows a patient on BiPAP. So let's talk about the advantages of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. First off, it offers the benefits of mechanical ventilation without many of the risks of intubation. It reduces the need for sedation, and the patient can retain the ability to communicate. Often, it will allow for intermittent eating and drinking, but only if the clinician deems it appropriate after having ruled out concerns for aspiration. It also avoids the risks of ventilator-associated pneumonia. So what are some of the indications for using non-invasive positive pressure ventilation? First off, respiratory failure, as well as dyspnea, tachypnea, and use of accessory muscles. If there are gas exchange abnormalities, you may consider using NPPV. Evidence exists for acute hypercapnic respiratory failure in COPD cardiogenic pulmonary edema, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in immunocompromised patients, facilitation of extubation, and for patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Insufficient evidence exists for pneumonia, asthma, and ARDS. I've compiled a list of diagnoses that we often consider and use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. These include pneumonia, asthma, some cases of ARDS, depending on the circumstances, including severity and patient's wishes for intubation, neuromuscular diseases, end-stage lung disease, for example, cystic fibrosis, or transplant recipi recipients with graft rejection, and patients with a do-not-intubate status. There are some absolute contraindications to consider. For example, a comatose patient, patients who are having cardiac or respiratory arrest, if there's facial trauma or facial deformities that don't allow proper fitting of a mask, and severe encephalopathy. The caveat here is that when the encephalopathy is secondary to hypercapnia, you may consider a trial of BiPAP to see if you can reverse the hypercapnia and regain mental status. There are some relative contraindications as well, and I've listed them here for your review. Physiology of NIPPV. So let's discuss the physiology of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Going back to first principles, this graph is useful. It represents the respiratory system divided into individual components, the lungs, the chest wall, and the combined system. On the x-axis, 
is the transmural pressure. On the y-axis is the lung volume, as reported as a percentage of vital capacity. The curve I'd like to focus your attention on is the solid line. You'll note that there are two dashed lines. One represents the chest wall compliance. One represents the lung compliance. And the solid line is the composite of the two. The important take-home message here is that the chest wall favors expansion, and the lungs have a re intrinsic recoil property that favors collapse. Where the forces of expansion by the chest wall and the forces of collapse by the lungs are equally opposed, that represents functional residual capacity. It's important to consider these dynamics as you think about the diseases you might be taking care of. This graphic represents two extremes you might encounter, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, and a normal lung. You'll note that in the case of emphysema, expanding forces predominate and the FRC is high. And in fibrosis, the FRC is low. These are adult diseases that you may not encounter so much in pediatrics, but I've compiled a list of diagnostic considerations that may help you think about this moving forward. So factors that could affect chest wall compliance include obesity, edema and ascites, neuromuscular weakness, and many others. Factors that could affect lung compliance include a variety of things that we commonly encounter, including pulmonary edema, ARDS, and many others. So let's look at a specific example. We could choose among many, but this one's useful. So patients who have neuromuscular disease, the expanding forces of the chest wall are quite weak due to neuromuscular weakness, and therefore the collapsing forces of the lungs predominate. By instituting non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, you can restore lung expansion, alveolar recruitment, and improve gas exchange. Let's look at some pressure volume curves to understand what we need to be thinking about. You'll note on the x-axis is positive pressure applied to the lung, and on the y-axis is lung volume. Represented is the inspiratory curve with the three different zones, the lower and upper inflection points, and you can see to the right of this graph are representative alveoli and their changes in volume with positive pressure. In this region of the curve, you'll note that the alveoli are not recruited and their change in size is minimal. But in this region, you have an optimal expansion and recoil of alveoli. And finally, the alveoli are overdistended. BiPAP. So let's look at BiPAP specifically. As you recall, BiPAP can be divided into IPAP and EPAP. First, let's look at IPAP, inspiratory positive airway pressure, and its influence on work of breathing. On the x-axis, you'll look at different levels of pressure support with a PEEP of zero, ranging from five to 20. So for example, to the far right of the graph, patients receive support in the form of 20 over zero. And on the far left, patients are spontaneously breathing. And on the y-axis, you see the pressure time product, which is a measure of the work of breathing. Regardless of whether or not patients were normal capnic or hypercapnic, both experienced drastic reductions in work of breathing in a dose response according to the amount of IPAP that was used. This was a linear relationship, and the effect was more dramatic in normal capnic patients. If, you, if we study the effect of EPAP, we again see you're familiar with the solid black line, which represents the IPAP alone, but now we've added two additional curves. For the squares, you see patients that are supported with BiPAP and a PEEP of 5, and for the triangles, patients supported with BiPAP using a PEEP of 10. And you observe that with increases in EPAP, work of breathing again is reduced until you reach an EPAP of approximately 10, at which point little is gained from increasing it further. So what this graph shows, again, adult patients, various disease states, looking at use of spontaneous breathing, CPAP, pressure support, with a PEEP of 10, or pressure support with a PEEP of 5. On the y-axis, you see the pressure time product, which is a measure of work of breathing. And what you find is that as you use 
move further to the right using BiPAP, whether 20 over 10 or 20 over 5, work of breathing is dramatically reduced. So what does this mean? What we observe is that IPAP reduces work of breathing by providing a greater proportion of the transpulmonary pressure during inspiration, the so-called push-pull effect. Whereas EPAP reduces work of breathing due to the fact that it counterbalances intrinsic PEEP. In other words, it reduces the threshold load to inspiration. It also increases respiratory system compliance by reducing the elastic load to inspiration. An important observation here, though, is that the optimal settings with respect to work of breathing may not match what patients report to be the most comfortable settings. And these two graphs show different measures where patients report discomfort with the BiPAP settings that they were using. Both scales show a very similar distribution. What this shows is patients reported comfort using two different scales. And you find that the settings patients report to be more comfortable don't actually represent the settings that maximally reduce work of breathing. So if you consider the previous slides that we reviewed with settings of 20 over 10 or 20 over 5, those are actually on the left portion of both of these curves and are not in the most comfortable range for patients. So the take home message here is that optimal settings may have to be a balance of reducing work of breathing as well as patient comfort. So let's dig deeper into the physiology. This slide is important and it represents the lung of a patient spontaneously breathing awake and sitting upright. It's divided into three different zones. These are the west zones that you may have learned in medical school. In zone one, the alveoli are overdistended and the alveolar pressure exceeds the arterial pressure in the capillary bed, which means although ventilation may be good to that region of the lung, perfusion is poor. Moving to zone two, the alveolus is recruited in a way that alveolar pressure is less than arterial pressure, and both are greater than the venous pressure. This establishes conditions where perfusion is perfectly matched to ventilation. Moving down to the dependent regions of the lung, or zone three, you find that the alveoli tend towards atelectasis and that the pulmonary arterial pressure and venous pressure exceeds alveolar pressure so that perfusion is good, but ventilation to that region of the lung is poor. So zone two represents a region where ventilation and perfusion are properly matched, and zones one and three represent regions where VQ mismatching occurs. So what does this mean for your patient? I want you to focus on this slide, where on the x-axis it represents lung volume, and on the y-axis it represents pulmonary vascular resistance. You'll note the further to the right you move on the x-axis, the closer you come to total lung capacity and the further left you move, the closer you get to residual volume. Either way, if lung volumes are low, you favor atelectasis. If lung volumes are high, you favor overdistension. The result under either circumstance is that pulmonary vascular resistance is increased. By finding the proper lung volume that approaches FRC, pulmonary vascular resistance is optimized and VQ matching can be enhanced. These are important considerations as you titrate your ventilator settings. So as we work to optimize VQ matching, some things we may need to consider are the west zones that we talked about previously and the compliance curves that we looked at in prior slides. If you look at the curve on the right, where the alveoli are poorly recruited and don't change much in response to changes in pressure, that's analogous to west zone three. The linear portion of the curve is analogous to West Zone 2, where alveoli are optimally recruited. And West Zone 1, at the top of the curve, represents where alveoli are overdistended. Summary. So in summary, as we put this all together, I'd like you to think about non-invasive positive pressure ventilation for the following frameworks. You might use it to enhance oxygenation potentially could use it for cardiac unloading. It improves lung and respiratory muscle functions. Thank you very much for watching. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.